Hi, everybody. A warm welcome to all of you joining us for the event today. I'm Catherine Hegarty, Director of Noma Architects, and pleased to be hosting the success successful series of PK events for the RIBA Bristol and Bath branch. This is PK05, Architecture and Innovation. As always, we've got a fantastic range of guests. We'll listen to each of our speakers and then have about 20 minutes for panel discussion at the end, which will be hosted by Murtaza Rizvi, who's a Bristol-based architect. If you've got any questions, please use the Q&A with your name and contact details, and we'll be sure to get back to you in case we don't have time to ask your questions. Following the Q&A, I'll then pop back for a final word before finishing the session within the hour. Please also refer to the Q&A for useful links from our speakers and information on upcoming events. First up is Helen Groves. She's a director of Atkins, being a highly experienced architect who leads the education team nationally. She's passionate about the importance of well-designed buildings and works with clients from pre-concept to post-delivery in order to create exciting and engaging places for people. Her presentation entitled Design and Technologies with Communities for Communities will explore the opportunities that data and technology can bring to working with people to create bespoke solutions. Please share your screen now, Helen. Thank you very much, Kat. It's great to be here. Um, I, I think this is a really exciting series uh, and um, in terms of bringing together um, you know, the innovations, the different things that we're all learning with and, and working with. Um, I've lived in Bristol for the last 15 years and, and as such I've been really interested to see how the city has been spearheading the development of smart infrastructure and that's some of the things that I'll be talking about today. So our focus really is on human interactions and um, intelligent buildings and places and understanding the relationship and the things that we can learn um, from the context, but really understanding it from a human point of view, um, the interaction with space and the built environment. Here's two examples of this. On the left, we've been commissioned to carry out some work on some schools in the northeast um, and looking at the full data analysis of the locations has helped us better understand the specific local need. And similarly, on the right, Atkins Go is a tool that brings together lots of different data sets to help us understand uh, the spaces. Now you'll all understand that it comes in different shapes and sizes. You'll all be familiar with drone scans on the left, uh, but also to understand, for example, EPC ratings when we're doing a master plan to really understand where investment has taken place already and where perhaps the new build needs to take place. Um, and this is a station example. Um, the spatial properties of stations and how people use them can also predict uh, the behavior and where we need to put things like uh, information kiosks or perhaps even where the cafe should go to understand people's behavior within a space. And sometimes it's about understanding the existing better. We've been working for some time with the University of Plymouth and they wanted us to visualize their, their spatial utilization better. So we built this tool for them uh, using simply the DWGs they had and their Excel spreadsheets. And this will develop more to be able to give them a tool to work with. Going to a different place now, um, all the other examples I've been giving you um, are about big data and working with it. And this is the other end of the spectrum, working with individuals to understand their needs and our HCD tool set, um, which goes from pre-feasibility to post-occupancy, but absolutely based on what people need. Oh, the slide hasn't moved on. There we go. Um, so you will know the scenario. You hold an open evening or a workshop for consultation and often all you get is the strong voices. Um, so this is a tool that we've developed to reach out to all the users. Um, for example, um, at uh, University of Glasgow recently, we had over 600 responses, um, which goes to show that uh, by delving into and understanding people better, um, we can actually give them spaces that they really want and really want to adapt to. Um, 
sorry, I've got a problem with the slides. It's not supposed to be showing that. I'm really sorry, Amanda. There we go. Okay. okay. We've also used it at Bournemouth University, uh, three different departmental groups coming together into one building. Fantastic for bringing everyone into the consultation, enabling them to communicate their needs rather than just defend their own space. Um, and that led to many fewer cellularized spaces and much better working environment for everybody. So I bet you're wondering, and I was going to mention digital twins. Lots of the examples I've already mentioned are elements that could form part of a digital twin, but most of them are hovering around the kind of naught to one two level. And we're carrying out lots of re research at the moment with our clients to develop this further. And we're all heading in the right direction um, to, to this more intricate detail. Um, but we're focusing on what does the architecture of the data look like? What, what's the big picture? And, and this is a simplistic graphic of how we perceived it at Atkins, I suppose, for discussion more than anything else. But you've got to remember that Digital Twin is the tool that assists in producing the outputs you require. It's no point having a tool and not knowing why you have it. So we started this conversation with Pembrokeshire County Council as to how we can bring all this information together for them. We're lucky enough to be working with them uh, not only on their new secondary school, but also on regeneration and number of highways projects. And we put together an early digital twin that brought these elements together and allowed the community to engage and comment. And the model was configured so that community could share their opinion and all their different streams of work that were taking place. And this information was fed back into the developments. Um, it was a fantastic example of how we can use digital tools to really engage with the community to enhance their own town. They were able to, to give their feedback at the right time so they could mould the development. So how else have we been applying this? At the University of Glasgow, we've not only been using technology, but augmenting it to include concepts of sustainability and resilience to ultimately future proof the university. As well as designing a number of the buildings on the new campus, we're also the design guardians for the whole thing. So we have an overarching strategic role. Um, at University of Glasgow are already on this and they're forming a backbone uh, to set the scene for understanding the technologies and limitations um, and to, to be more intelligent and efficient in the use of resources um, to give an improved service delivery and quality of life and ultimately be more sustainable in their delivery. Here's just one example. The lighting system um, in the Institute of Health and Wellbeing forms a low energy data mesh and each of the lights are linked wirelessly by Bluetooth. Now that's not an end in itself, but rather to say, how can we configure this better? How can we actually use this as part of the BIM tool to really configure a knowledge pattern that forms the whole thing? So coming back to Bristol, um, this 2019 document talks about the specific context and all the good work that's already happened. Um, you know, Bristol is really digitally enabled and well connected um, and it supports the access to employment and education and linking all those services. But how can we improve that? How can we make it better? We're currently working with Ordnance Survey and Cardiff Uni's uh, computational urban, urban sustainability platform uh, to research the benefits of creating the national digital twin on behalf of Digitally Built Britain. And this is the next steps of projects on a civic scale. And we'd love to bring these studies to Bristol to show how the impact and the knowledge and the learning is brought back. But this is a, a complex diagram to really uh, highlight one important point that actually um, that the quality of the data in and the quality of the data out is what really matters. It's not an end in itself. So small data not being uh, swamped by all of it is really uh, the thing that is value at this stage. So in terms of things that we propose would be beneficial for Bristol to go into the energy use, retrofitting for net zero carbon and the carbon reduction scheme, um, but also plan preventative maintenance to actually understand the resources and how we can do that. There's a lot of good things which are happening already. We'd like to take that further in the discussion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, just absolutely fascinating and the ways that you can start to capture data to understand behavioural psychology so that spaces can be used by everyone. And um, yeah, hopefully hear a bit more um, during the questions also about Bristol and smart cities. And um, yeah, so next up, we have Next up, we have Scott Grant. Thanks, Scott. Who? 
Am I am I still am I still on? Do you want to share your slides, Scott? Yep. Let me just get it here. Is that just moved off the bottom of my screen? That's okay, great. thank you. Thank you so much. So thanks for inviting me. It's just a pleasure, pleasure to be here. So I'll just run through this. I'm going to talk about experiential visual engagement for next generation design. So yeah, but what what does that mean? So we're talking about what the aim of visualisation is in architecture these days. Is it to impress, convince, inspire? Um, or evalu evaluate and arguably it's all of these things with the overriding aim to solicit response and provide a basis um, for meaningful dialogue. So we're, we're looking at the base premise um, and, and how we evolve that. So visualisation has remained fairly steady in architectural design for centuries and it's served as reasonably well. Uh, the extent of visual engagement involves creating pictures and everything from hand-drawn concept sketches to emotive photorealistic images that fulfil an important function, um, but are, are they right for the level of engagement inspected, expected these days? So thinking how things have changed um, in recent times and the expectations of, of the typical design client. And again, as one example, it's been more than a decade now that children have grown up playing sandbox games like Minecraft, and they are now joining the workforce with the ability to understand complex digital, digital forums. In ways, how do we evolve this process further? Because we do use visualisation already as an industry to engage and inform clients at different stages using imagery and models. And it's a case of shifting the focus from the creation of abstracted images to creating detailed environments where we have the ability to engage the audience with various interactive platforms that elevate the experience and promote better understanding of the space. And it takes advantage of the one thing that almost every under, everyone understands, and that's reality. And that's what we're looking to simulate with a personalised experience. Um, so thinking of how the traditional office are now, I guess, blended kind of working day looks. Uh, this is typically how design and technical detail is captured and developed at present using an array of sophisticated design modelling and engineering tools. Um, everything can be created in detail, but we're, we're not just talking about the use of that technology um, to enhance visualising designs or specific curated presentations. What we're talking about is exploring better ways to interrogate and iterate the design from within. And the, above, the examples above show concept level and detailed design in both SketchUp and Revit. And to evidence that this is actually happening at the moment, I wanted to share some examples of current use cases in different sectors. Uh, the example shown here is for a leisure, a leisure operator in Scotland. And these photos show early stage concept layouts and scan to BIM models of proposed refurbishments uh, being visualised. And taking that to the other end of the, the, the scale, these uh, practices show leading, leading architects, fosters using the same technique, using their own live model based data and bringing together people in this way. We can enable a focus on the subject matter that doesn't exist otherwise and it gets around the, the socially limiting effects of VR headsets. So taking this principle forward, we can iterate design for various purposes and this example is for a residential scheme supported by Secret West, where we worked with the design team to iterate versions of the Revit master plan model from the inside before generating the various forms of media for the submission. And then this goes beyond the production of media for internal use. And we facilitated a transformative kind of dialogue between the scheme developer and the planning authority, where we enabled a fully accurate walk around of the proposed site which had the desired effect of illustrating the amount of green space. Um, in a similar fashion, Everton were able to take proposals for their new stadium out to the city. Um, and this was all derived from a coordinated visual production pipeline where hundreds of people were given a virtual tour of the development and the same assets were used to create you know, VR experiences and a multi-purpose mobile app. Uh, this principle also has significant use in the field of construction, where planning, training and site monitoring can all be assisted by this ability 
um, to facilitate dialogue around virtual representations of the digital models and where construction planners can anticipate most issues, it's difficult to get other people um, to feed into that process. Uh, clients also see the advantages of this approach to help with their own presentation requirements. And this example here is for a large scale engagement for a new campus redevelopment in the banks of the River Clyde, where over 5,000 Barclays Bank staff are being relocated from various sites across the city. Then at the heart of most visualisation and where it's seen most of the time is the, the, the marketing and promotional side and every, everything does need that promotional push at some stage and we can arrive at this stage ready to maximise the effect of good visual design and the example shown here is for the Expo 2020 legacy project. Um, for more regular marketing this is a cost effective approach to providing remotely presented or in-person virtual tours using these scalable visual models. And this example shows a system where you know, a standard residential apartment um, can, a suite can show any, any apartment on the development from a central controlled location. And another recent trend that's worth touching on uh, based on the changes in current meeting protocols is the surge and uptake of online presentation platforms. The example shown here is a remote streaming of a, a recent VR environment for a commercial building in London where this can be deployed on any standard laptop using a web browser and there's numerous ways to adapt this data for better reality based engagement and amongst these functions are the ability to provide lightweight virtual walkthroughs using our magic door function or place virtual products in the real world as shown here. Finally, and as a segue to Dave's presentation, I also want to highlight how we can blend some of the traditional world with the digital, and these photos show the latest AR overlay function, which uses efficiently produced 3D printed models as a basis for a digital overlay that can be a great focus for discussion with all the advantages um, of the infor information rich data sets that power our projects. So thank you very much for listening. For the questions after that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so okay. much, Scott. Thanks, Scott. There was, um, there was a bit of a glitch in the lead in. So um, to everybody listening, that was Scott Grant, Chief Exec of Solus Group. And um, really exciting presentation. It feels like we're almost entering into an age where we'll be able to visit buildings all around the world virtually. Um, so I can't wait to hear a bit more about that during the questions and answers. And um, last but not least, we have Dave Ewing, who's product manager for Proto Labs, who supply rapid, rapid digital manufacturing. He's a chartered engineer with a wide range of manufacturing and 3D printing experience. He's passionate about new technologies and how they play a role in designing engineering and building better solutions. His presentation will take a look at recent 3D printing news and innovations in architecture. If you could please share your screen now, Dave. Is that sharing? Yeah, ready to go, Dave. OK, super. OK. Uh, when I signed up for this talk, I, I didn't immediately know what um, Picha Kucha was, and it reminded me of this really in my childhood interests in drawing and building. And at that time, I wanted to be an architect, but I studied aerospace engineering. Um, but I kept a keen interest in sort of architecture and the way that engineering can cross multiple disciplines. Around about the same time in 1983, uh, 3D printing was invented by Chuck Hall. Uh, reputedly, it was when a traditional printer jammed and left a little. Um, three-dimensional deposit of ink and that inspired him to create the process that uses deposition to create parts. A few years later Protolabs was born, the company I, I worked for, uh, when a guy called Larry Lucas connected some machines to the World Wide Web. Uh, this turned out to be quite successful, both the World Wide Web and the ability to upload CAD models and create a prototype or a bespoke part almost instantly. Fast forward, there are now at least seven distinct types of 3D printing. 
Uh, they range in scale from single atoms up to tens of meters, and they can use almost any material you can think of, exotic metals, human cells, recycled plastics, ceramics. I expect that most of you used to 3D printing, um, probably for model making. Um, here's an example of something called Carbon 3D, where the print time has been reduced to just a few minutes. But I'm here to tell you that right now and in the future, 3D printing is much more capable than just that. Why is it such a big thing? Well, it gives us complexity for free, and I say free with exclamation marks. All the industrial revolutions were powered by something for free, or nearly free, coal and oil free energy, telecommunications, free and instant post, silicon, free computing power. Does 3D printing and digital manufacture give us mechanical complexity for less? Yes, it does. I worked on the world's first metal 3D printed bike, and now as a thriving industry producing customized bikes. In this example, the nodes are custom and uh, the use of off-the-shelf carbon fiber tubing. This triangular node and strut construction method is just applicable to civil engineering as it is bicycle industries. I went to a talk by Sander Hoffman from Arup, who'd done just that, not only using less material, but enabling a design to be attached to a historical building with limited additional load capacity. You can see here on the left, the fabricated component and the final 3D printed design, which was considerably lighter and connected to standard um, rods and struts. In this project, I worked with a software company to understand what it would take to design and manufacture hundreds of glass facade brackets that are each unique and optimised to carry the load in a very specific way. Not only were we looking at the 3D printing aspect of this, but also the design complexity and how to handle huge amounts of data. And this is where generative design plays a symbiotic role in enabling mass customization. Loads and design constraints are used to compute thousands of iteratively improving designs and then set them on an optimum. Um, weight saving designs are great for transport, but using less materials in building is, is also desirable and sustainable too. And this is what exactly what MX3D did in a five year project that resulted in, in 3D printing a bridge that had a 20 ton load capacity. This bridge was made entirely using robotic welding um, with automated crawlers. Another project in Shanghai by the School of Architecture at Zhongzhou University. This time the bridges were made in plastic. Apis Core currently have a record for the biggest 3D printed structure. This two-story home is over 10 meters high. What's quite interesting about this is the previous record was held by a 10 by 10 by 10 meter gantry crane. Um, the innovation that these guys have done is, is actually created a 3D printer that's considerably smaller than the thing it's printing. Concrete extrusion is not new. Here's a machine doing it in the 60s. And since CNC machining, placing things accurately is also fairly straightforward. What will really proliferate 3D printing is new materials and the novel thinking that being able to put them wherever you want unlocks. Here's a great concept, um, pumped storage of kinetic energy using the principles of hydroelectricity um, rather than pumping water up hill, um, water or air is pumped down to pump water out and bubbles on the sea floor. Could these bubbles be manufactured in situ using 3D printing? Possibly. One area that 3D printed components excel are designs that incorporate flow or flow of fluids or gases or heat. Passive ventilation has been used since antiquity, but could we 3D print buildings that look amazing and cost nothing to heat or cool, especially if we combine that with new materials like hydroceramics? The holy grail of 3D printing is really mixed material. Most printers can only melt, bond or extrude a single material. And this limits the potential for embedding sensors, power or reinforcement during the build. Students at the University of Nottingham have printed this complete with electronic moving parts and nerve endings. Perhaps high tech will take us back to low tech. Here a structure has been 3D printed in mud or adobe, one of the oldest and perhaps most sustainable building mediums. Wood, coral and even biological media have been used in 3D printing extrusion. A 
I really like this example by Reef Design Lab, um, 3D printing artificial reefs and giving something back to nature. They've also done projects where they've attached um, artificially printed structures to sea walls to encourage um, biodiversity. It's also a two-way exchange. There's a company called Biomason Bricks who've been using the properties of coral to create bricks rather than the energy to fire them. One thing's for sure, we're all individuals and we crave customization and we value individuality. As advancements in hardware and software enable this at an economical and sustainable price, there will be a proliferation of creativity. So final note, how do 3D printing is shaping architecture and engineering is a, per a personal interest of mine. But if you need smaller bespoke components or models manufactured, please feel free to look at the ProtoLabs website. We've got a great range of insight videos, white papers and other articles that explain the technologies, as well as podcasts to keep you up to date. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks so much, Dave. That was really interesting. Um, feels like not even that long ago before nobody had even heard of 3D printing. So it looks like there's been some rapid advancements in the past few years and fascinating to see those architectural applications. Um, I'd like to now hand over to our host for the panel discussion, Meta Zar, who has a particular interest in this field. Um, so over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you, Catherine. So um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, picked up um, a lot of um, concepts, abstract ideas and use of technology in, in a huge range of fields. Um, and I just wanted to spend 20 minutes or so just to get into a really good discussion with all three of you. Um, pick up on some of the things I saw in your, your presentations, which really chimed with a lot of the things I've had experiences with as an architect with a little, uh, little experience of working with innovative technologies. Um, and just to just to mention, if there's any questions that come in from the audience, you know, please do fire them, fire them in. I'll keep an eye on them and try and weave them into discussions as they come in. So I'll start with uh, Helen. I'll go in, uh, go in order. Um, Helen, it was really interesting to hear your thoughts on, on how you could use how we could use as architects um, data data to to really shape the future of you know spatial optimization for for clients uh, in in their in their assets on a large scale um, but also capture a kind of consultation if you like scenario and um, I really just wanted to get into a few things I mean really just as, as a little warm-up I wanted to ask you a question on the use of data um, and ethics kind of uh, in terms of privacy. So with 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 all this um, data being collected, what, what what are your thoughts on how it's used to inform your design? Um, can you can you give people assurance that we live in a digital age now mm -hmm. that, uh, that there's, they can they can feel like they can contribute what they want to, you know, in terms to, to shape the data honestly without it being taken taken too far? Absolutely. I think it's a really important point um, that the, the big data that I talked about at the beginning obviously is anonymized by its by its nature and, you know, topographical citywide. Absolutely. Um, you know, there isn't uh, so much an ethical issue with that. When we started setting up our, our human centered design tools, that was at the, you know, at the heart of our decision making. You know, how do we actually make sure that we can never uh, identify individuals? Um, and so we're very careful. We have a whole, um, uh, you know, data protocol that that we adhere to. Um, and we're very careful when we're taking uh, the, the information in that it's at, at no point can we identify individuals and we won't, um, you know, take it beyond a certain amount of granularity um, in order to, to to ensure that because it's very uh, it's very important that people have that reassurance so we can hear their true opinion. Um, at the same time, on the bigger scale, obviously, you know, when when we know that, uh, you know, certain governments are using face recognition for tracking and other things, you know, there's something that um, we have to be very aware of the path that we want to choose. Um, uh, th there's another part of Atkins who's very focused on security um, and, you know, data security as well. So we're able 
and to kind of you know cross fertilize and take uh, you know some of that research that's been done by that side uh, to ensure that we are not only getting the best information for our clients to be able to make the best decisions but also protecting people at the end of the day we have to make sure that we're putting the needs of, of our communities and, and the people that we're working for as an ultimate client um, at the heart of what we're doing so completely agree yeah that's that's really kind of reassuring actually I mean in some ways um, you know we're living in an environment where we're all using phones social media and there's there's almost no hiding from the fact that all our information is online uh, unless of course you can you know crawl away and, and hide somewhere and um, very quiet i mean there's one one thing i kind of picked up in your presentation was the use of um the term design guardians and it strikes me as an architect um, you know we we are in oft, often in roles of being lead designer um and we've got to bring that information together and ultimately we have design responsibility but you, you mentioned this term design guardians, which I thought was quite poignant. And is that a way that you're you're kind of terminal you're terming this the, our role as an architect in gathering data and using it to you know produce essentially a, a, an architect driven output or, or, or one that represents the output mm. of, a, of a red team? Yeah, that, that was specifically to do with um, a role that we we're, we're undertaking with the University of Glasgow um, in the uh, we're not the master planners, but we are the designers of a number of the buildings on, on their new campus um, and specifically um, being able to underpin uh, the, the, the design intent, which includes the ambition for smart campus, which includes the sustainability protocols, which includes the design quality, taking that through. Um, and so really that is a role that as, as architects, I think that we are um, you know we are fundamental within that um, that it's important that we not only focus on our own narrow role but also the wider concept of you know how can this benefit our clients the community it sits in and the wider uh, the wider whole so I think the design guardian design for the benefit of everybody um, and truly taking into account the wider inputs including sustainability you know the future generation but also the future opportunity be it data be it um, uh, you know understanding that whilst it's not an end in itself um, it's a means to an end to make better places for the people who are inhabiting them mm, that's great i mean just just before i move on to um scott um i just wanted to ask you about just just to, to share your thoughts on the role of um, you know smart cities and those principles in responding to the climate crisis in a post covid world you know we're, we're experiencing rapid urbanization across the world mm -hmm. and you know, gdp is associated with big cities if you like london creates uh, you know has a, a, a quarter of um gross domestic product for the for the, for the country mm -hmm. and so how can smart data and, and you know smart city principles be used to create healthier, more responsive cities. I just wonder if you could share your thoughts on that. Bring it home. Sure. I think the important thing to realise is, is that it's not an end in itself, that actually gathering this data together is so we can make better decisions out of it. The the, the algorithms, you know, within the, the, the magic box, if that's what you want to call the digital twin, um, become uh, only useful when we actually know what we want to do with it and I think that's where Bristol is leading the way um, in terms of the uh, the infrastructure that they're putting in place to really gather together what people um, have said that they want within the city, um, but also to drive generation of, um, of, of, you know, of innovation, of new jobs, of, um, uh, you know, reduction in carbon usage, in transport usage, etc., uh, cars usage rather than public transport. Um, but also importantly, to be able to say, do we really understand in the existing fabric, you know, how much energy is being used, how our utilities are being you know, measured, et cetera. Um, and only then does that data become useful because, it, because then we can target. You know, if you have an abstract notion, people find it much more difficult to engage with and to actually make a difference in the decisions that they are making. And I think that's where to actually make something tangible in a way that, you know, the very simple model that we made for the University of Plymouth, um, the estates team could then say, oh, that's what it means, rather than reams and reams of data in a spreadsheet to actually visualize that and make it useful for them so it is it is not the thing which is going to change um you know the data isn't going to to, to, to change things it's what we then do with that data mm. that, that's a great point on visualizing you know yeah, as architects we work in a in a visual realm mm. and i think you know actually highlighting that as 
something that can illustrate reams of data um, can definitely, you know, it, it would yeah. definitely make things easier for me and I'm sure others and the general public to understand. Um, I'm, I'm just going to cross over to Scott and talking about visualisation is actually quite a good point to do that. Um, Scott, how are you doing? Can you hear me all right? Good, good, yeah. Can you hear you okay? Brilliant. Um, thanks for sharing some of the work you're doing um, in terms of um, creating socially connected, engaging virtual experiences. There's a lot of really good examples um, that you shared. And um, I, I wanted to just really start off with your thoughts on how that technology might trickle down to smaller practices. I mean, it looks for some of the stuff you're looking at, you know, showing us look really polished, really high end. And I'm, I'm aware that there's, you know, there's, there's ways of using it on a, on a smaller scale, but you know, what are the practical things that, you know, sm smaller practices, if you like, can, can start to do to, to kind of engage better with those technologies? Yeah, I, th I think if there's already a, a reasonable uptake of, of kind of digital processes, which I would, I would credit, you know, most small practices now um, having, or small to medium sized practices having a, a good capability, I mean, that, that's really the starting point because the, the efficiencies that you get on a, a kind of huge master plan um, to an individual kind of apartment block or a small office building are, are, are kind of the same. The efforts really in putting the, the models together correctly to allow that. And if you're doing any level of traditional visualisation, you're already expending the effort and budget it would take to do a, a series of in, images um, for that. So yeah, I think that there's, there's certainly smaller steps and everything doesn't need to be highly polished to be effective. So hopefully that that was clear as well. This is a good route to getting the, I guess, the high end shots as and when you need them. But what we're talking about is better visualisation throughout the process without this interpretive kind of layer that, yeah, the six, seven, eight years you spend mm. learning and training architecture teach you to do that, but that's that that keeps a lot of that um, close to, to us as an industry until far too late in the process. So yeah, but we've got to be confident enough to have this inclusive approach to design and the, the steps to take that, you know, the software tools that, you know, natively will allow you to do this. Um, like I say, I showed a number of different platforms, you know, iPads and these things are, are not prohibited at all because we own them. Um, in terms of some of the bigger installations, then yes, for big projects and um, kind of big clients want to see the project with that level of clarity from start to finish. And it's a, a great way to give an exclusive showroom type service um, for, you know, a, a aspiring star architects dealing with kind of star and brand clients. Um, but at the same time, what, what we're doing is, and we'd, we'd love to you know, be, be able to roll this out further, but we offer our own facilities. Uh, we have facilities in central Glasgow and, and uh, central London where people come in and they, they plug in their models, you know, you know, whether it's SketchUp, Revit or anything else that they're using for, for design, then that, that's a really easy way to do it on a selective basis without a prohibitive kind of outlay um, on the, the kind of installations, which yeah, you, you would only purchase if you were using, you know, on a, a almost a daily basis mm. to facilitate that. So yeah, I think you can you can scale this up and down quite easily. That's really good. I mean, um, I can I can see I can see that actually. You know, there's a lot of hardware out there. You mentioned iPads. You know, people. Yeah. Are, you know, that's becoming more and more common. Um, yeah. as, well, as well as other tablets in, in our households and um, you know just playing around with that can be a way to unlock it. Yeah and headsets I should say as well are a few hundred pounds rather than you know thousands of pounds so yeah as a way to design mm. you know it's quite isolating it's not great for dialogue but as a way to understand design it's, it's much better than a monitor for actually yeah. you know feeling the space as you create it around you. I think maybe some of the challenges you know uh, for for maybe the architects in you know, my my generation, I'd call it, is that we've been taught in traditional ways, but we're coming into yeah. an industry where there's lots of use of um, innovative technologies, you know, heads, headsets, and I, I've seen it's maybe the, the younger the younger guys in practice um, that are more au fait with this technology who are really kind of leading the way, and I can see that there's this. There's this um, use of technology that has to be right as it, you know, in an yeah. appropriate. And um, you, you mentioned like the next generation. You, you know, you mentioned that there's kids who are coming through and uh, you know growing up on games like Minecraft, where they're 
developing advanced spatial formation, you know, that's pretty much standard to them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're going to be the, the people who are using this, um, you know, the, your kind of technologies more in the future. And I, I just, I was just wanted to pick up on that. I mean, do, do you think that's somewhere where we need to be going more in terms of being an architect using you know, immersive experiences, you know, virtual 3D experiences from the very outset, rather than, you know, how, how does that balance with, you know, like, um, um, yeah, I think it's how much you want to challenge aspect. tradition, but I guess I, I wouldn't be talking here if I was a, a big advocate of the, the the traditional approach. So I, I guess I'm here to, to challenge that. Mm. Um, but I, I do believe in it as well because I mean I've, I've worked in architecture, um, worked in a kind of really small practice, and then worked in a really big 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 practice. Um, the team split, kind of trying to document, you know, big buildings, like hospitals and things, and you just see all the problems with trying to connect that together, and then you do that internally for a while, and then you have these moments of presentation, and it goes okay, but you, you, things, you know, that there's very rarely, you know, people come back totally satisfied from these design review meetings. Um, like I said, I spent most of my formative years li listening to people getting quite upset about something somebody else said or not understanding something that they poured their, their heart into for, for two months. Um, and, and now the technology is there that we can just open up. And I think there's a real, a real responsibility and a challenge um, in the design community to, to learn how to curate that sort of information because that, that's as big a learning curve. Um, is learning to use the technology. So actually, it's usually the yeah the the, the, the technical people are the technolo technology specialists who learn how to use the software. But everybody else needs to be able to take take that information with them and curate a really good dialogue session mm. and be able to control input because um, there is there is a obviously a chance that they'll see quite a lot through this. But yeah, that that's the opportunity and the challenge in the in the same. The same scenario. That, that's great, actually. Um, I just wanted to expand out from from VR now, use of it now, and maybe use of it in the future in in a wider global scale. Um, you know, just kind of relating back to you know what Helen was talking about with smart cities, but outside cities. And do you think there might be a a scenario, or do you still see a time in the future when we're visiting buildings virtually? I mean, one example I've seen is uh, in China where there's um, you know, really popular heritage destinations. You know, we, we, we kind of more recently have called these beauty spots, if you like. Yeah. But people are visiting or, or you know, uh, authorities and, and you know, guardians of, if you like, of the, of the heritage environment are, are encouraging people to visit buildings virtually rather than in person, because in person can actually, you know, obviously can cause wear and tear and damage and risk and all that. Do you foresee a time when we'll, we'll actually be visiting buildings virtually rather than in, and in person? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think it will replace um, visiting them, but where it's where it's not feasible or it adds an extra dimension, because again, I guess it democratises access because there's some places that are either expensive, dangerous and accessible, and there's some pretty big companies, kind of global names that you'd know, putting a lot of money um, into this kind of digital preservation effort. So I think that that will be a big driver for VR, you know, that anybody, it doesn't matter what your background is, your, your kind of social status or your, your finances. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's sites all around the world that, yeah, I think VR definitely is an opportunity. And we have a heritage division um, who are, are close to a lot of that. But yeah, it's a, a kind of natural extension of that technology. And um, I think in terms of doing visiting buildings, um, in this sector specifically, then yeah, I think we can do a lot. And so, what's happened recently has, has put a big, a big emphasis on how, how do we reduce travel or what we call needless travel. Um, I know again, there's, there's like you can debate the economic impacts of that all day long, um, but yeah, there's there's a certain efficiency now that we've we've kind of tried it with you know the, these conference calling systems. Um, that the next natural thing is. To, to stick a headset on and then we're a bit closer while we're remote. So that this is okay. Um, I can I guess we can't see the audience but we can see each other reasonably well. But if we, we, we extend this to where it's going then yeah we are sitting here with headsets and we're more naturally in a room together. 
and as we design new types of space for new types of blended working, then yet we're going to have to deal with an audience that is remote who will only want to jump on a plane or get in a car. And we can actually do that. What, what's been, I guess, good for us is it's, again, we've had a kind of 10 to 15 year propulsion and acceptance mm -hmm. of all of these things um, and, and being able to build these environments and recreate them actually that capability was there already so it's a case of yeah even if it's a concept design how does a, a designer deliver a service to somebody sat in a, a home study or kind of kitchen table scenario well actually they, they should be able to do it on this where they you know they make changes or they turn up with a model mm. the recipient at the other end can put a headset on and switch between the screen and the headset and have a really good conversation where it is immersive and then when we do get back together because there's a whole debate about you know, whether people will return to yeah. office working in the same way. I think it will be blinding. What it will probably do is just level out. I think the, the city limits will just get bigger mm. as people who work closer to home or in hubs close to a central office. So again, there's a huge um, potential opportunity and challenge for the whole industry and, and how that, that balances balances out. But yeah, I think, I think there's going to be more of that. Mm. Um, and that will be in line with, with different ways of using buildings and, and different different buildings that will have different purposes. I think that sounds like the um, the challenge to architects listening is to be aware of all these technologies and um, engage with them, you know, be at the forefront of them, because it is an exciting time, I think, to, to engage in, in actually designing and um, thinking of the best way to convey that information, depending on the situation going forward. So, OK, thank, thanks, Scott. I wanted to um, Bring in Dave. Hi, David. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Thanks for waiting patiently. I'm. Um, I'm. I've. I've got some questions for you. And there was a really. It was a really good presentation on on just your background and the whole. You know, the birth, if you like, of um, 3D printing. And there was some. There were some slides in particular that that um, grabbed grabbed my attention. Um, they, they were the ones where you'd taken a kind of standard connection, if you like. This is quite a geeky thing to ask, I suppose. But you took a standard kind of structural connection and made it more efficient. And you showed a really good example of an Arup, um, uh, if you like, process uh, product, which as it went from the, the standard structural component over to the right, it looked like it became more organic and it looked almost natural to me. And I wanted to pick up on, on your thoughts, really, on the use of you know, using materials efficiently um, in a lightweight way that can provide you know a structural solution. Um, do you, do you think there's a lot to learn from the natural environment in in terms of you know the, the next generation of 3D printing processes and products that you're creating? Yeah, I, I I think there is a lot to learn from the natural environment, and and all of those examples have been designed, if you like by a machine it's it's not a natural design it's an artificial design um, but using a process that we're all fairly familiar with that works in a natural environment you know natural selection so um, the computer generates lots and lots of different designs that could fulfill the design brief and then it iterates and um, picks out the, the ones that, that, that are better um, so yeah I mean and, and it's interesting that it does come up quite often with a very organic bone like looking looking structure um, and these are quite alien to our traditional sort of design processes where you know we fabricate something out of out of plates and, and, and weld stuff together so um, and those new design tools enable you know new white saving designs but because um, that's a real symbiosis with 3d printing because you need a way to produce these very complex designs which mm. otherwise you could design but not not make I just wondered if you could touch on what what might happen um, to to you know these these components that are 3D printed, or, or maybe on a, just a small scale. I'm just aware of you know circularity, if you like, um, but if, you know effectively all I mean by that is you know a, a product gets to the end of its life um, and needs to be recycled, reused. Um, could you could you share maybe some examples if you have them on on how you're incorporating those kind of processes. So, you know, obviously, so materials are used, you know, efficiently and, and, and kind of responsibly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose it depends on the type of material you've, you've picked. Mm -hmm. um, my, a lot of my experience with metal 3D printing and, and so, you know, 
particularly steels and aluminiums are mm. kind of infinitely recyclable. Um, but there are other 3D printing processes out there where you're making perhaps carbon fiber, which is a lot more difficult to recycle because it's a composite. Um, so, you know, it, 3D printing enables that, but there's, there's, there are different materials in different ways, and they've all got their own different merits. That's that's really that's great. That's great. I mean, um, there's a there was a few there's a few things on um, 3D printers, and um, you know the fact that they're getting smaller, and that makes them you know to me that seems to make them more adaptable to kind of use on construction sites. Um, have you got and you mentioned a few examples? Have you have you got any further thoughts on how that might help? You know, trickle down some of that technology onto into smaller applications. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, 3D print um, is always improving in, in speed and, and quality and um, capability here on. So, yeah, it, it, you know, in the, in the near future, perhaps as a combination of things that are fabricated in the machine, like, like prefabrication, like roof trusses are now, for example. Um, do you think, I mean, we've had a question from the audience, actually, it seems quite um, appropriate at the moment for this discussion with you. Um, the question is, when do you think the economics will become viable for contractors to choose robotic manufacturing over traditional building? I suppose this is something that is more appropriate to a large scale, but, uh, you know, are, are we there on the smaller scale? I think at, 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 the, at the moment, probably not, but also, you know, we, we use robotics all the time from when we are designing something, we don't do longhand calculations, we, we use simulation software and that's, that's effectively robotics to, to, to calculate loads and validate designs. Uh, on the building site, you know, we use concrete mixers, we use lifts, we use power tools. Um, in a way, the technology is already um, within us and like I said you know we use CNC to cut joists and, and prefabricate components um, I, I think you'll see it as a as quite a gradual transition where you know more and more robotics will be on site um, and and that that will enable you know perhaps a much more flexible way of manufacturing and it, it, and you know if, if you think about how we pick construction sites we pick easy sites which are flat and level and, and straightforward you know perhaps mm. robotics will enable us to use much more marginal sites which need yeah. customization mm. um, and that level of customization can be designed and programmed in rather than having to rely heavily on on, on skill that's that's great i mean there's, I, could, I could speak to you all day about this day. <laughs> but um, i'm just conscious I, i'm gonna i want to bring um bring helen back in um, Helen, if you can hear me, just to um, kind of touch back on um, you know, your, your presentation. Mm -hmm. And we've had another question in actually from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think the key benefits of advancements in data and technology to stakeholder engagement throughout the project from concept to post delivery will be? And similarly, so, so the question there is on the key be benefits. Mm -hmm. And similarly, what do you see as potential blockers um, in work for, for various stakeholders being? Okay, um, I mean, I think the the key benefit now is is almost a democratisation, mm. um, and and to to really allow people to be involved, um, and and the challenges that we've had, you know, when uh, b before. I mean, I'm, I'm still of the generation where where we I was trained on a drawing board, um, and and of course most of the meetings that we had were round a table, and if you had a, a say a lunchtime you know open uh, open event or workshop to get people engaged, um, then generally only those who had really strong opinions either you know for or against uh, would tend to turn up, um, and those with quieter voices you didn't really hear. So mm -hmm. the opportunity to, to to truly engage and to have your say in a manner which is going to influence and make a difference because it's part of the, the, the flow um, of a project generally. I think at the briefing stage is hugely important uh, and then later on down the line um, no architect ever wants to hear 
I didn't realize it was going to look like that or that surprise, you know, um, and so to be able to using the techniques and the tools that, um, uh, that, that that we've been talking about today to be able to truly visualize and to give people a, uh, a really honest example um, or visualization of what it's um, what it's actually going to be um, before they've you know invested uh, the, the money in the actual construction I think is hugely important and that allows everybody from you know, I mean, my, my field is, is education design, so I'm thinking, you know, from the kind of, you know, new uh, uh, year seven who is wanting to find out about their school and understand it, particularly in these post COVID days where everything is new and slightly virtual um, so they could find their way around the school and not be freaked out by, you know, by, by that new experience right up to a kind of university professor who um, has a, a particular, let's say, view of the world, if I'm being slightly unfair and uncharitable, um, you know, professors who uh, like to do things a certain way, let's say, to be able to encourage them and say, look, this is how it could be. What about this? But also to allow optioneering in a way that we've never been able to do before, I think is really, really powerful and it allows people's voices to be heard. Mm. That, that's that's a really good um, point, and, and it's kind of one that links to another question that's coming from the audience uh, about um, you know uh, you know whether you know groups that are you know maybe more disadvantaged or don't have access to technology um, yeah, in, in maybe from from various various groups you know if, if, if there's going to be challenges in incorporating their their kind of um, comments if you like their 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 kind of feedback into projects and. I mean, again, we, we could keep talking about this, but I'm just conscious, unfortunately, of, of time, really. So, you know, I think we should use this as a, as a basis to carry on the conversation. It's really good seeing all of your examples. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I really look forward to kind of seeing more of them out there so we can um, you know, basically use this tool as an architect. I'm going to hand back over to um, Catherine now, if I may, just to just to wrap up and thank her. Thank everybody. Thanks, everybody, for me. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, time isn't on our side. Um, but yeah, just think it's so wonderful to hear about these innovative ways um, that are being used to produce like really considered responsive architecture. So thanks for talking a bit more about that. Um, and yeah, very big thanks to our speakers, Helen, Scott, Dave and Mertzar for hosting the discussion. Um, we hope everybody watching the event has really enjoyed it. The next one will be PK06, Architecture and Culture. And um, just a, a few more upcoming events for your RIBA diary. Um, 10th of September, there's the Practice Clinic, the Environmental Impacts of Running a Practice. 18th of September, there's a small talks on innovative design for a globally sustainable future. On 30th of September, this year's two-day smart practice conference is confronting the climate challenge to provide you with the tools to meet the 2030 climate challenge targets. And there'll be events for Black History Month in October with more info on that to come very soon. The RIBA understand that many of you may be facing some difficult times ahead, so please look at their COVID guidance pages on architecture.com, the RIBA website. Um, yeah, so we're here just before two, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to the speakers and the production team. That's all from me. Stay safe, stay well, and many thanks for listening. <laughs>